this down front and those can get together because it's easier for me to watch you and talk with you here and off to the sides. First, and first of all, let, let me thank my, my host for inviting me back up here. And uh, what they've indicated to me was that they're primarily concerned about trying to get you all together, unite uh, as black folk and try to see if you can survive what's coming up around the curve in America and around the world for black folk. And particularly, they want me to focus on economics. So this evening, I'm going to take, a, take maybe, he wants me to spend about an hour running through a variety of things with you give you a better understanding of where we are and where you ought to be going as black people. And in the course of my talk in the next hour, nine times out of ten, I'm going to step on some of your toes and talk about some things that you consider to be sacrosanct or, or semi-religious or things that are sacred to you. I might even talk about some of your black leaders. But what I'm going to tell you today is very, very important for you. And I want you to understand clearly that black folk in America in a world of trouble, you in a world of trouble in this country and in the world, and contrary to what you hear, I don't care whether it comes out of a black mouth or a white mouth, anybody that tells you that black folk are progressing in America is lying to you. You're lying to you. And right now, if we don't do some very specific things in America and in Baltimore in the next three years, not 200 years from now, but in the next three years, you are through in America. You're through. You're going to become a permanent underclass in three years. And an underclass means those individuals who by the nature of their circumstances are, will be forced to live as either beggars or criminals. That's where you're going. I'm going to say it to you again in case you missed that. Here in Baltimore and any blacks in America, you got three years to get your act together or you're going down. You're going to be forced to be either beggars or criminals for the rest of your existence. You got an unending influx of immigrants coming to this country. They're going to bury you alive. That, that bill they have right now in Congress, that is your tombstone. They're going to stick that up over your head. And any black person in, in this city that's shucking and jiving, they better get out of your way so you can get ahead because things, bad things are coming. This auditorium should have been full right now with black folk that understand the nature of your circumstances. And obviously all the teachers, your elected officials, your ministers are shucking and jiving in Baltimore. And when I say bad times are coming, it's because we are not focusing on what we're supposed to be focusing on. You've been intentionally misled and misdirected. You've been sent down the wrong road. And in comparative and proportional terms, we are exactly, exactly where we were as black folk in this country. We're exactly where we were in 1860 on the eve of the Civil War. You have not moved not one iota in 140 years. And people are shucking and jiving. What you're doing is enjoying the fruits of the social illusion. <clears throat> by them telling you somehow that because you have social integration and civil rights that you have achieved something. We as black folk have achieved absolutely nothing with civil rights and integration. Any black person who got more than a third grade education should know that you had more. You had more before integration started than you got today. You've gone backwards. Now let me give you an example when I say it comparatively speaking in 1860. On 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, <clears throat> in this country, you only had about 287,000 black people that were free out of almost four and a half million. The other four and a half million were enslaved all over America. Only, four, only 287,000 were free. And yet, out of those 287,000 black people, they had succeeded in acquiring one half one half of this nation's wealth. One half of one percent of the nation's wealth. With only 287,000 free. Now here we are, 140 years later, in the richest nation on earth. 140 years later, you still own, own and control one half of 1% of this nation's wealth. 
And contrary to what people keep telling you through a lot of civil rights leaders, civil rights and integration does not decide equal opportunity for you. You cannot get equality through civil rights and integration. What gives, decides your opportunities in America is what you own and control. That's what decides your opportunities. You can have all the civil rights you want. You cannot go into an expensive restaurant or an expensive hotel if you don't have any money. They're playing games with you. You must own and control. And what they fail to tell you is that the, the whole process of slavery and Jim Crow segregation did not happen to black folk by accident. That wasn't any big accident for you to wind up being enslaved for over 500 years in this country and 1,300 years around the world. That wasn't an accident. It happened intentionally. What your leader should be asking is why did it happen to you? Why were black folk enslaved all those centuries? For what? There must have been a purpose. If the purpose was strictly to maldistribute and misdistribute almost 100% or 99 and one half percent of all this nation's wealth, power, resource, privileges, businesses, and income and controls of all levels of government. That was the purpose of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. So one group of people could live a very advantaged lifestyle and these over here who are black would have nothing. That was the purpose of slavery and Jim Crow segregation. Now here you're talking about civil rights and integration. When did you correct it? If, other, if the other group controls 99 and one half percent of everything and you control nothing, where is your equal opportunity? Where is your equality? Why are you sending black kids to school every day and people are telling them that you're in an equalized society, a colorblind society and you got nothing? You own and control nothing. I can come in this city right now and drive around. I'll bet you right now I can't find two blacks in this city that owns more than a three-story building. Everything in this city that's high-rise belongs to whites. You don't own any bridges. You don't own any in, in the tollways. You don't own any airplanes. You don't own any boats. You don't own any skyscrapers. You don't own the media. You don't own the banks of any consequence. You own nothing. You don't produce anything. You wear clothes, but you don't produce any of any consequence. All you wear eyeglasses, you don't produce any eyeglasses. You don't own any hospitals. We own nothing. And just as happy as we want to be, go watch TV. Every black you see has been put into a safe category. The social illusion that's being created for you to, to dissuade you from doing something to save yourselves, they put a social illusion on TV with safe blacks. The images that are put in front of you show you that those are safe blacks. Any black that's successful in America has some kind of an illicit relationship with a ball. He's either running with a football, baseball, basketball, tennis ball, golf ball, standing on the stage telling jokes, dancing, singing, pretending he's having a ball. They even got a program now to be called the Ballers. Because see, white folks know you're safe if you've got a relationship with a ball going. Because there's about that much distance between a cotton field and an athletic field. In the athletic field, you were chasing cotton balls. Now you're chasing basketball and tennis balls. You have moved one eye older. The same person on the cotton fields now on the basketball teams and the football teams. We're not moving. One half or one percent of the nation's wealth. That's what slavery did to you. It maldistributed everything in the hands of the dominant white society. And as an example, you didn't inquire into wealth since 1860. Let me show you some other indications. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, almost 99% of all the black people in America, slave and free, was working for whites either in a white corporation, in a white business, in some white office, making wealth confident for whites on a plantation or whatever it is. <laughs> we 
We're not moving. One half or one percent of the nation's wealth. That's what slavery did to you. It maldistributed everything in the hands of the dominant white society. And as an example, you didn't inquire the wealth since 1860. Let me show you some other indications. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, almost 99% of all the black people in America, slave and free, was working for whites. Either in a white corporation, in a white business, in some white office, making wealth competent for whites. On a plantation or whatever it is. Here you are, 140 years later, and again, 98% of all the black people in America work for whites. They either work in some level of government, white businesses, city government, state government, school teaching. N only 2% of all the blacks in America work in their own communities for themselves. Only 2% work for themselves. You haven't changed in 140 years. Let me try it another way if you still don't understand my point. On the eve of the Civil War in 1860, again, at that time, going to look at all the prisons in the United States and examine their records, I found out in the records, when I looked at, in the prisons in Savannah, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York, um, Phil, uh, Washington, D.C., looked at all the prisons, and I found out at that time, even though only 287,000 blacks were free, blacks made up over 51% of all the prisoners. You weren't even free and you made up 51% of the prisoners. Now I look around 140 years later, today, and I still find black folk make up over 51% of all the prisoners. Where have you changed? You don't own a thing. You're still in prison. Still work for other people. You enjoying a social illusion. Now you we are fat and happy because we can go to someone else's restaurant. We can go to someone else's school. We can we can go to someone else's hotel. We can live in someone else's community, and we don't understand the negative aspects of that. That is a death sentence. And we don't understand what racism is. So what we are doing is committing suicide. We got three years ago before we go into it. Three years ago, before you're gonna see massive suicides happening. Because you don't even understand what racism is. I've gone all around the world, even when I was with President Carter in the White House, I had to take trade missions in the third world nations, in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East. And invariably, wherever I spoke, I would ask people, do you know what racism is? I would even offer $1,000 for a person to tell me what racism is. I still got black folk today who don't even know what racism is. They talk about it. Find me one that understands what racism is. Every time I ask them, what's racism? Well, Rock Anderson, racism is uh, not liking somebody. It's prejudice. It's bigotry. It's hatred. It, no, it's not. Racism is a competitive relationship between groups of people that are competing for the ownership and control of wealth and resources and power. That's what racism is. Racism is a group phenomenon. Racism is a team sport. You cannot be participating in racism if you don't play as a team. You can't correct it. You're not even in the game. Racism is like football, basketball, and baseball. You play as a team or you lose. And I got all these so-called educated blacks in America on TV heading up civil rights organizations, getting elected to public office. Don't you understand what racism is? That's why they don't do anything. They go there and tell you, well, I'm in the public office, I'm a mayor or governor. My thing is to make sure everybody get along. That's not affecting racism. Nobody asked you to get elected to office and get, make people get along. Now, racism never existed on the earth until the 1400s. Never had it. There was no such thing as racism. You had people, for instance, who, who had practiced various forms of discrimination. We even had slavery. But to be enslaved prior to the 1400s was for only three reasons. Either you were a victim of a, of a religious persecution, or you, were, you had some indebtedness and was enslaved, or you were a prisoner of war. Those were the only three reasons you could be enslaved. 
until the 1400s, about 1442, when uh, Magellan, uh, uh, he went around the navigator, Henry the Navigator, rather, went around the coast of Africa and picked up about 16 blacks and brought them back in 1442 and gave them to the Pope as gifts. And those, those slaves worked around the Vatican in Italy from 1442 and about, and about 1488. And it became a good thing to have all these blacks working free around the Vatican and in the Pope space. No labor to be paid for. <coughs> Other people wanted those advantages. So Pope Pius put out a public edict, Pope Innocent, I'm sorry, Pope Innocent put out a public edict saying, look, if you want some slaves, go get some, but get black folk. He put out a public edict saying, if you're going to enslave anybody, enslave black people. And once that hit, all of a sudden everybody got interested in getting slaves. And that started the whole movement in 1488 and 1489. Now something happened very important in 1495. Y'all know what happened in 1495? Allegedly, for this guy who was over here looking for drugs and some other thing, what was his name? Columbus, y'all remember that guy? Now he came over here and he supposedly discovered America about seven years after the Pope had put out his edict using blacks as slaves. Now all of a sudden he goes back to Europe, everybody, a race started. All these countries got into a race to develop the Western world that Columbus said he had discovered. And what was the race about? They wanted to colonize and get resources, wealth of gold, silver, and cash crops from the West, and West because they never knew that the Americas existed. Was, people in Europe never knew that there was a North America, Central America, and a South America. They got into a contest to explore it and to find it and profit from it. And, uh, and because at that time, prior to that, thank you, sir. Prior to that, the only, the only, can you all hear me as well without this? Which one, which one do you need? Can you, you need this one? Okay. Um, so prior to that time, they had a, Europe all through the 1400s, what they used to call that, was going through what's called the Dark Ages. They, they, Europe was crime-written, impoverished, diseased. And they said, Let's get, they said we, can, we can resuscitate Europe. We can strengthen this continent. And we can find a way to develop the Western world, the Americas. Latin America, Central America, North America, if we can develop that country, we can bring ourselves out of a ditch as, Europe, as an European continent. And so they all said, well, how are we going to do it? They said, we need a labor class. So they all rushed down and picked up the Pope's edict and started grabbing blacks off the west coast of Africa. It was picking those blacks up for an average of about $25 a piece. And they started setting up, so they, they want a 1,500% return of their money. They started selling them for 400 some dollar piece. And so they started shipping blacks all into this country, in, in Latin America, and Central America, to put them to work as a labor class. Now, the countries that started that, 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 that race, it started with Arabs. Arabs were the first ones that started enslaving black folk. I don't know if you all know that or not. Arabs were, the, Arabs were the first ones that started enslaving black folk, and Arabs have been enslaving black folk now for 1,300 years. Arabs first started enslaving blacks in 765 AD when they marched into Africa in what they called in search of the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. And they tried, and they pursued Africa until the 12th century when Timbuktu, when they overtook Timbuktu and Timbuktu fell, then they started dominating Africa. But the Arabs were the first ones. Portuguese were the second ones. Hispanics were the third ones. Then the Germans and the Danes. Then the French. Then the English. The Norwegians, on down the line. Then lastly was the American Indians. Everybody's enslaved black folk. And that's where the race was. A race, a contest started to develop the Western world. The rule was he who gets there first with the most slaves and make the most money would be the most powerful nation on earth. And the race began. Everybody was in the race to use 
Everybody's enslaved black folk. And that's what a race was. A race, a contest started to develop the Western world. The rule was he who gets there first with the most slaves and make the most money will be the most powerful nation on earth. And the race began. Everybody was in the race to use black folk except black folk. And began shipping blacks in to America. And they shipped black folk in. <clears throat> they, they justified it initially by saying that it was, a, uh, it was an economic issue. Everybody knew it was an economic issue. It stayed an economic issue all the way from the 1500s up to the 1700s. In the 1700s, when the evangelical movement moved to this country, they switched enslaving black folk to make it a religious issue. Why? Because King James then wrote, when England took over the slave trade as the biggest one, and started leading the slave trades, and started beat, winning the race, King James rewrote the Bible, called the King James Version. <clears throat> and even had, uh, what's his name now, what's, what's the uh, writer? Huh? Shakespeare and the rest of them writing. All of them wrote, they rewrote the Bible. And they rewrote the Bible, then, they, 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 they were, then since England was the dominating country for slaves, all the slaves, states were mandated to use <coughs> scriptures to justify the enslaving the black people. So religion then became a means of codifying slavery. And the slave owners started teaching black folk. That when, you, when you hear me talk about the white, the master and the slave in the Bible, on earth it's the white man is the master and you're the slave. And you're mandated to do three, three things. One, to accept your station in life. Two, to be humble and obedient. Three, to work hard and don't steal and don't lie. And lastly, to look for pie in the sky after death. And that stayed true up until about 1880. At that time, religion was the justification for slavery. This is important for you now. Slavery then moved from being an economic issue to a religious issue. It stayed a religious issue up until about 1859, again, on the eve of the Civil War. On the eve of the Civil War, a guy named um, uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin, remember Charles Darwin? He wrote, a book, he wrote a book called The Survival of the Species, or The Survival of the Fittest. And what he's been doing along with a lot, lot of other pseudoscientists was trying to connect a linkage between the lowest and the highest in life. What he was saying is that is an amoeba that's that small, is it greater or smaller than the elephants that's big? Is a blade of grass lower in the chain than a tree? And they kept making, setting up these vertical systems. They call them genuses and species going from the lowest of everything to the highest. But by that time, the white society had successfully redistributed by 1860 almost 97% of all the wealth and power into the hands of the dominant white society. The race was nearly over by 18. 60 or 1859 when Charles Darwin wrote his book. And they looked around and said, look, there are whites, now let's get to human beings. We worked out the relationship between slave, I mean, but between a, a bush and a tree and an amoeba and an elephant. But look at the black. The black has nothing. He's on the bottom. And the white master's on the top. He owns and controls everything with all the education. So obviously, the white man must be superior to the black man. And so then, all of a sudden, Racism and the whole issue switched. Slavery and all switched from being, a, from being a religious issue, it became a biological issue. Then, that, then, then, then at, when it became a biological issue, all governments mandated that you must put a person's race on his birth certificate, driver's license, whatever it is. It became a biological issue. But the race was over then. When the race was over, they looked around. And since whites had used slavery for so long, whites own everything. Almost 100% of everything, 99 to one half percent belong to the dominant white society. The slave owned nothing. The white was on top, the black was in a ditch. The race was over. When the race was over and blacks had nothing and whites had everything, the race ended. 
and what the society did then, they took the word race, R-A-C-E. They scratched the E off the end of race and stuck a suffix called I-S-M. I-S-M is a suffix which means keep the prevailing conditions, let nothing change. And that's where racism came from. The race was over. Whites won it, they had everything. They took the E off the end of the word, stuck I-S-M, that's where racism is. Racism is a competitive relationship starting out to get wealth and resources and power. And But what they teach you now is that racism is, has something to do with liking people, getting along with people. That's not racism. And when I ask people, I said, do you know what racism is? They say, it's prejudice. You cannot eradicate prejudice. Everybody got a right to be prejudiced. All prejudice is that you got a preconceived judgment or feeling about something based on previous experience. Right now, because of ice cream, I love, love burgundy cherry ice cream. So guess what? I'm prejudiced towards burgundy cherry ice cream. So now when I want some ice cream, I exercise my prejudice. I say, I'm going to get me some ice cream, some burgundy cherry ice cream, because that's what I'm prejudiced for. Now I say, now, where am I going to get it from? I've gotten a lot of ice cream from a lot of stores, half of one worth a quarter. That's what Baskin Robbins had the best. So now I'm biased towards which ice cream parlor? Baskin Robbins. I'm biased to go there to exercise my prejudice. Now when I get into Baskin Robbins, I'll walk up and down the counter, looking at all the cherry mocha, the black chocolate, chocolate rock, peppermint juicy fruit. I look at all that ice cream. And then guess what I'm doing now? Now I am discriminating. I'm discriminating against what kind of ice cream I want to, to, to satisfy my prejudice. And so I'll pick, and I go down and I say, oh, burgundy cherry, that's it? Now, that, that prejudice, that bias, that discrimination has nothing in the world to do with racism. Don't let people keep tricking you by comparing prejudice and discrimination with racism. That's why all the gays jump and say, well, we're just as bad off as black folk. We're, they're prejudiced against us. That has nothing to do with racism. You tell people, I don't care about your being prejudiced or discriminated. That doesn't bother me as a black person. I'm scared of racism. I'm scared of the fact that you're going to own and control everything. That's what you should be working on. So everything you do in this city must go after eradicating racism. Not prejudice, not bigotry, not getting along with people, not bias. You must try to redistribute some wealth and resources back in the hands of black folk as quickly as you can. That's what you need to be working on. Now, since we have never done that, and I told you slavery mal distributed almost 100% of all its nations, wealth, power, resource, privileges, businesses, and controls of all levels of government into the hands of the dominant white society, well, look at what's happening. We never corrected it. And since we never corrected racism the way it started out, that means in this country right now, that the average white person in America has 3,500 times more wealth than the average black person. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? Let me give it to you again. You cannot be equal when the average white person in this society has 3,500 times more wealth than the average black person. Even if you're a middle class black in the 40, 50,000 dollar range, the white person has 800 to 900 times more wealth than you. If you're a black female, that means the white female, the white female has a dollar for every two cents you have to run a household. Let me even be, since you all still don't understand this point. In America right now, where you think you're so equal in Baltimore, that you're so free, that you can spend all your time enjoying life, and not worried about what's gonna to happen to you in this society right now. American society, I got two white men. I got two white Americans alone that have more wealth than all 36 million black folk put together. If I take Ralph Ellison and Bill Gates, they got more wealth than all the black folk in America put together. Where is your equal opportunity? Where are you equal? What are we thinking about? 
when it's wealth that decides what you own and control? Where are you equal? What are we thinking about when it's wealth that decides what you own and control, decides what freedom and opportunities you're going to have in a society? Now you want to know what is wealth. Wealth is not income. Don't confuse wealth with income. Income is what you get to maintain you from one week to the other. Wealth is what you got left over after you paid your bills and stacked it up. Wealth is surplus labor. That's all wealth is. Wealth means somebody has labored and you've stored it up and it has value on it. That's how whites were able to become rich and get all this wealth. That all those millions of blacks, the five million blacks they had enslaved, they never paid them. And when the European society sent whites to America, they said, go to America. They didn't say what the lies you hear nowadays about, well, whites came to America looking for religious freedom. No white person was that stupid. No white person was getting on a ship, sailing for four months around the world to find some place to pray. They didn't come here looking for no religious freedom. They came here because the governments were saying, if you go to America, we will guarantee you we will give you free land and free labor. And you'd have to be an idiot not to be rich if we give you free land and free labor. And that's where the whole franchising system started, like Burger King and McDonald's that, get, that set up a restaurant for you. They give you all the equipment and the, and the menu and all the food, and you pay them a free. And they sent the people over here from Europe to inhabit America. They gave them soldiers. They gave them some money and told them the soldiers would protect you away from the Indians. And we give you some slaves. And what you got to do is raise the crop products, tobacco, indigo, rice, cotton, and send it back to Europe. And we'll pay you a fee. That's what it was all about. Everybody got a chance to get rich but black folk because we never understood what racism was. We still don't understand what racism is. So we got black folk right now in America, in this city, that try to speak out on issues affecting black folk. And as soon as they start saying, we're not going to take any more of this, you're mistreating us, somebody says, well, he's, that black guy is racist. A black person cannot be a racist. Let me say that again so y'all don't, don't hear me. It is impossible under present conditions in this country, in any place in the world, for a black people to be racist. You don't have any wealth and power. You cannot, you cannot control what white folks do. You cannot enslave white folk. You cannot tell them who they can marry and who they can't marry. You can't deny them an education. You can't make them pick cotton six days a week, 18 hours a day for you. You cannot be a racist. You can be bigoted, and biased. And I hear that all the time, he's a doctor answer, but I, I heard that black guy out in the parking lot, he called that white guy a redneck cracker. Isn't he a racist? No, he might be bigoted towards white people and poor whites, but he's not racist. That, poor, that, that parking lot attendant can't do anything to white people. All he can do is talk. He cannot stop white folk from getting an education, from owning a business. And so what they've done now is confuse the issue of what racism is so that all black folk in America are paralyzed. They're scared to do anything. They won't speak up for themselves. They won't fight for themselves. They're scared somebody's going to call them a racist. They can't even be something that somebody's calling them. And worse than that, you've allowed all the people you're competing with to also fall underneath that co cover and declare they're just as bad off as you. That's why Hispanics and Arabs and Asians and humpbacks and lesbians and midgets all get into the affirmative action program. So you've got to learn how to play the games. Now let's deal with some other, other concepts now that you understand what racism is. Another concept is minority. Any black person in Baltimore, let somebody call them minority, you should cut them after you shoot them. <laughs> that is an insult for somebody to call you, and for you to call yourself a minority, nobody's going to be that stuck on stupid, unless you got an, a stupid license. You live in a social democracy that was set up in 1789 the first law of Congress, 
1789, we became a nation saying, this is a white country. This is a white country, and the quota on black folk coming in is zero, unless he comes in as a slave. And the rule in a social democracy then is that the majority will win and rule, and the minority will lose and suffer. Why would you go around calling yourself a loser, I'm a, I'm a loser, I'm a minority, and I'm suffering? Why would you do it? Why would you teach your children to call themselves a loser? And worse than that is in cities like Baltimore, why would you in Baltimore be going around pushing the city to give you a minority set aside when you make up 65% of the population of the city? You are the majority. <laughs> Nobody on earth is supposed to be that silly. I go to Detroit, Michigan. And I'm speaking to the legislature, and they said, well, Dr. Anderson, before you talk, we're going to give you a plaque. And I said, no, before you give me a plaque, tell me what are you doing for black folk? They said, well, we got a 5% set-aside program downtown. I said, downtown where? They said, in the Office of Minority Affairs. I said, this city is 90% black. <laughs> Why are you calling black folk minorities in a city where they're in the majority? Hey, somebody's elevator does not go to the second floor. Why do you keep calling yourself a minority and trying to get a minority program when you're the majority? So the one white woman on the city council said, well, Dr. Asson, well, if you, uh, what do you want to do? I said, in this city, the city council needs to pass a resolution saying that in this city, black people are the majority population. Once, you, once it's pointed out that you are the majority population, then it is against the law for other people coming in to rape and rob you through the government. Whites cannot come in there and take all the resources out. It's a violation of your rights. If you've had the city council in Baltimore to pass a resolution saying in this city in Baltimore, we are a black city. That's 65% that's black. We are the majority population. Same thing in Washington, D.C. where you got, We had a 77% black population. They're giving black folk 4% of the resources. So what whites have been successful in doing is that they are, they are the majority in the suburbs and they're also the majority in the city even though they don't live in there because black people won't stand up for their rights and say, no, I don't want any majority in the minority programs. I am the majority and you sort of develop all these resources in this city for me. I should not have to come to Baltimore and find absolutely no black businesses of any nature. Why am I, and I go to Detroit, Michigan again as an example. Detroit, Michigan is a 90% black city. <clears throat> they got 146 gas stations in Detroit, Michigan. 146 gas stations in Detroit, Michigan. Arabs own 141 in a black city. In the black city of Detroit, Michigan, Arabs own not only the gas stations, they own the grocery stores, party stores, liquor stores. The Koreans in Detroit, they own the barbecue restaurants, the nail shops, the wig shops, the hair products, distributorships. The East Indians in Detroit, they own the rest of the businesses. They own the Dunkin' and Donuts, the cheap motels, the check cashing services. Blacks own nothing in a city where they're the majority population. I got a million black folk in Detroit that owns nothing. Now, what's the impact of that? That's why in the 2000 census, the United States government declared Detroit to be the poorest city in the United States with the highest crime rate. And everybody's sitting back in the black leadership saying, oh, why are we so poor? You're poor because you're set stuck on stupid. There is a direct relationship in this country between how many businesses you own and how poor you're going to be as a group. Those groups that have no businesses are going to be poor and imprisoned. It is not the government's responsibility to help you do anything. The government responsibility and the police department's responsibility is to put you in jail and keep you out of the way. When you have a Katrina situation, 
which is on one of my videos. I started talking about Katrina seven to eight years before it even happened. When you have a Katrina situation, which is on one of my videos, I started talking about Katrina seven to eight years before it even happened. That was almost 10 years before Dick, that was what happened to Katrina. They got me crying on the video and they wouldn't take it out. But the video tell me what's going to happen in that city because the poverty rate was so high, 82% poverty rate in New Orleans before Katrina even hit. And nobody was concerned they didn't understand that if you don't have any businesses, you're going to be poor. The reason black people are the poorest people in the United States is because we don't own businesses. <clears throat> now watch this now. In this country, in America, the group with the highest income in America today are Asians. The, middle, the medium family income for an Asian in America is $55,000 for medium family income. Y'all follow this along, so when I'm long after I've left you this evening, you'll never forget this as long as you live. The median family income from an Asian is the highest in the United States at the end of the group, 55,000. Underneath them are whites. The median family income from a white person is about 53 to 54,000. The median family income for these Hispanics that you're also worried about and getting them into the country are over blacks. They're at 32 and 33,000. The median family income for black people is $19,400. Now, why are black folk on the bottom in income? Here it is now. Asians got a $55,000 income, median family income over here. Here's why they got that income. One out of every 10 Asians are in business. Again, $55,000 income there at the top. One out of 10 are in business. Let's go down to the next level. You got whites now over here. Whites are at fifty-three to $54,000 income in that general range. They got one out of every 34 in business. Hispanics got one out of 54 in business. Black folk at the bottom with one out of 104. If you don't have any businesses, you're going out of existence. Why is that now? It's because all you're doing is working for a living. We are the only people that encourage our children to go off and get a good education and go get a good job. No other group of people tell their children that. No other group is that silly to tell their children Go off and get a good education, and then go get yourself a good job working in a white company someplace. Everybody else tells their kids something different, and I'll explain to you with Chinese a little later. We're the only people that don't encourage our children to start businesses. If you go put your child into a job, or if you're working a job, you gotta understand the purpose of a job. A person, the purpose of a job is not to enrich you. You cannot get rich working a job. The only way you can get rich working a job is if you're good at stealing. A job is designed to maintain you. A job is designed to keep you one way from the welfare line, unemployment, and food stamps. Right. You work a job until you get too old and they retire you, and you got to go out and beg on the streets. They might, you might get lucky to give you a silver watch. A business will redistribute wealth and power to you eight times faster. If you have a business, you can also get a salary. But you can also get capital gains. You can also get depreciation. You can get appreciation. You can write all, you got all kind of tax loopholes. You can write off all kind of things on your, on your business, against your businesses. You can do all kind of things. The system is set up where those who don't have businesses pay all the taxes. 
Winn Dixie had about 500 stores one year when I was over education in the state of Florida. I looked at the records. They had about 526 stores in the United States. Winn Dixie, like Safeway, 126 stores. And I think one year they only paid $9 in taxes. They got all kinds of loopholes, flip back, take backs, and everything else to make sure they don't pay any taxes. You work at a job, you, you, got, you got nothing you can write off except your interest payment on your house and your house taxes on your house. That's it. The rest of your money is going to take care of the rest of this country. And we're the only people who have no businesses. Black folk are paying more than their share of taxes because we are so silly we won't start businesses. Now, let me go to another issue. If you start businesses, what must you do? How do you start those businesses? I put all that in power numbers. Start businesses at this late gate, it's too late for you just to simply go into a business. It is too late to simply go into a business randy, or randomly say, well, I'm going to start a business. I don't see any flower shops on this street, so I'm going to start a flower shop. It ain't going to cut it. Now, at this point, the door is almost closed on us in this country. If you're going to go into a business, you must go into a business where you have a competitive advantage. You must be able to tell me or somebody, the reason I'm going into this business is because I have a competitive advantage over my, other, over the other, my competitors. And I'll ask you, what are your competitive advantages? You must build your, your, build your business around two things. Wherever your people dominate in population, or wherever your people dominate in spending patterns. That's how you go into business. And if you unify yourselves, you got a chance. If you don't, you're through. Now you hear people talking about doctors, we should go into business because we got a $700 billion annual disposable income. You're right. They said we're, nine, we're the ninth richest nation on earth. You're right. Black people in America's annual disposable income is higher than Sweden. Pakistan, India, uh, North Korea, South Korea, Vietnam, and all the African countries put together. But we are the poorest people in the country because we do not practice group economics. Everybody on earth practices group economics but us. Again, Powernomics talks about all this stuff. So did black labor, white wealth. Everybody practices group economics but us. Now what is group economics? Group economics means you must learn how to pool your resources in a vertical way and buy from your own people up and down a chain. Just that simple. It says nothing, you don't have to love all black folk, you don't have to be kissing on them and hugging on them, but you should support them and buy from them. We won't do it. Now in group economics, the rule is this. Your money is supposed to bounce eight to 12 times before it leaves your hands. It's supposed to bounce eight to 12 times before it leaves your hands or leaves your race. That means that if you got a dollar in your pocket right now, that dollar should go to another black person and another black person, 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 another black person till it passes through eight to 12 times before it leaves to go to a non-black hand. In America, Hispanic money bounces six to seven times. Hispanics in America right now that you're all competing with, they spend their money to their own people six to seven times before it leaves a Hispanic hand. White money bounces eight to 12 times. Arab and Asian money bounces 13 to 14 times. Jewish money bounces 18 times. Black money doesn't bounce once. As soon as a black person gets paid, he'll run over you trying to get to a non-black business to spend it. As soon as it, right now, if you're out in the street, every black dollar right now in Baltimore is going into a non-black hand right now. They're committing suicide. Every time you fail to spend your money with your own people, not only have you failed to practice group economics, but you flush $11 down the toilet. When you leave here right now and you go out there and you stop at a gas station, and you buy, you buy a dollar's worth of gasoline, which is about a thimbleful, about like that. You buy a dollar's worth of gasoline, you just threw $11 down the toilet. It didn't go to a black hand. 
Anytime you put your money in another group's hands, you are aiding them in wiping you out. Now, if you're going to practice group economics, Thank <laughs> you.